connecting. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this discussion of a huge idea, which is can we, meaning the world, come together and figure out a way to identify the next unknown disease that risks becoming a pandemic, but before it does. It's a monumental task involving technology and databases and machine learning and artificial intelligence and sensors all around the world, uh, somehow integrated into a single effort that receives political support and, and operational capabilities. Uh, so to have a discussion like this, we need some amazing people. And so on this panel, we have, we have plasma physicists, we have business people, we have a poet, we have a best-selling author, we have epidemiologists, we have a former intelligence uh, senior official, uh, but we only have four panelists. So what that tells you is that these people are amazingly diverse uh, and deep in their understanding and their thinking. Um, before I introduce the first panelist, Murat Saitnepiesov, I'd I just like to share one fact that uh, Jose Ramon uh, Calvo, one of our panelists, told us yesterday, our group, as we were preparing for this session. He said that right now, or recently, it was, was discovered the, the earliest trace of the new coronavirus uh, in wastewater. Uh, and that earliest trace was found in a sample that was taken uh, on March 12th, 2019. It happened to be in Barcelona, uh, and it was just after the uh, the Mobile Conference, so the huge international conference, uh, <laughs> of 60% of whose participants were from China. Um, imagine if nine months before the world started to wake up to this danger of the new coronavirus, and really a year before it was declared a pandemic, we in the world had detected it and had then been able to prepare and fight it. With nine months or even a year, imagine how many lives would have been saved. Imagine how... The first panelist, Murat Saiknipiesov. Uh, now I live, by the way, in Istanbul. Uh, when I left the Foreign Service, I moved here. I have many energy, business, environmental solutions, and I'm involved with think tanks uh, like the Atlantic Council. Um, so Murat, Murat is, is the person who's conceived of this initiative. And he, uh, the way I got to know him was he invited me to a, a fantastic series of events uh, in Davos on the margins of the World Economic Forum called Caspian Week. So Murat, he is our plasma physicist. He's, he's trained as a physicist, uh, but he's taught himself oil trading. He taught himself finance, so he became a self-taught banker. He's now a, a businessman living in Geneva with a commodities trading company, but also a big logistics, co logistics company uh, with 50 vessels traversing the Caspian Sea, the Volga River, moving commodities. And my last comment, and I'll turn it over to Murat, is that um, there was a point a few years ago, where his shipping fleet got so large, 50 vessels, it was no longer possible to manage and optimize which ships go to which ports when and pick up which commodities in what order. So working with some mathematicians in Novosibirsk, Russia, where Murat also did some studying, uh, he came up with an algorithmic solution to allow for the management of this beyond human capability, highly complex task. So that approach inspired what Murat's going to tell you about right now. Please, over to you, Murat. Uh, I think you're on mute, Murat. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Frank Richter, Chairman of Horasis, for the opportunity to speak uh, and to organize this session. Uh, First of all, again, uh, my name is Murat Sietnipesov, uh, and uh, since uh, already 23 years I am in business. And uh, during my business career, we were, I was always trying to implement a uh, scientific uh, approach uh, into the business, and particularly trading and logistics. And uh, last year, uh, our business, and I think practically all businesses, were affected and even people's life uh, uh, were affected by the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic and uh, we started uh, we understood that uh, whatever you will do uh, on the business side uh, such uh, 
force majeure could really change your life. And uh, we migrated from the real life to the virtual life. Uh, on the business side, we had some lines of the business completely stopped. Some of the business started to boom, especially related to the digital technologies. And uh, we, uh, we started to uh, dedicate our efforts uh, and trying to find a way how to detect earlier uh, the possible new viruses, and uh, it's called now dangerous pathogens future, for the future. And uh, the big world, and also to attract techno new technologies, investments, new ideas from the big world to the Great Caspian region. And uh, potentially, this is one of the few non-typical examples uh, where the ideas from the greater Caspian region to help the big world. And uh, we are hoping that uh, we will be able to implement at least part of this idea in the real life. And this will already help a lot. And uh, uh, as I told, uh, we started uh, moving to toward this direction uh, around six months ago, uh, autumn 2020. Uh, and we studied uh, available sources and we understood uh, that uh, there is no earlier detection mechanism uh, for the new viruses. And uh, also I have a personal belief that uh, some kind of balance uh, is changed now in the world and uh, we will start getting new dangerous pathogens, viruses, bacteria and other problems uh much often and much faster than before and uh we think that uh, world should be prepared for this uh and if we will take the covid 19 uh experience like matthew already told now post factum uh covid 19 was detected in barcelona from the samples taken from the wastewater 12th of march 2019 it means uh, practically eight months before it was detected in China, and practically one year before uh, this happened in Europe. Again, second time, second detection. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we could speculate what could happen if this uh, could be detected earlier or later, but practically we lost almost one year in this early detection. And uh, lack of early detection it means lack of preparedness this year could be spent for prepare the healthcare systems economics businesses and people's life social life uh, for the for such pandemic and i think we could save uh, hundreds of thousands of lives even potentially millions of lives uh, trillions of dollars in even the united states i think spent already more than 10 trillion dollars to uh, to fight against the existing pandemic and we are talking about the global level. And uh, this is not a commercial project now, it is a global initiative. And uh, we would like to invite international organizations, regional organizations, governments of the countries, experts, businesses, and people to participate in this initiative. And today we have ideology uh, practically finally defined, and we can share with the interested uh, people interested in the project and uh, uh general idea of this to create a global system where we will be able to do systematization of accumulated fragmented knowledge available in the world and to apply digital technologies data science mathematics and this is the typical example of the multidisciplinary project and uh, what we see in the world that uh, a lot of people working on these problematics, but uh, mainly they are narrow minded and medical doctors are thinking about uh, medical consequences, symptoms and so on. Uh, data scientists, they are thinking completely, completely different. Mathematics, they are on theoretical field, but uh, we didn't see a proper attempt to do systematization of all these efforts. That's why it is called global system. I will still try to share my screen, but didn't work up to now. If this will appear, it will be fine. But okay, if not, not.
Uh, you can just describe it. In just a sec, for other panelists, if you're not speaking, maybe you could mute because sometimes there's an echo. Yes. First of all, is important what is disease X? And SPWHO definition, disease X represents the knowledge that a serious international epidemic could be caused by a pathogen currently unknown to cause human disease. It means here we are talking, first of all, about currently unknown pathogens. And in parallel, we will also discuss existing pathogens, in particular COVID-19, of course. And uh, uh, now, how we are going to do this? And for that, we have already quite uh, clearly defined methodology. Uh, and there are several stages. And the uh, first stage is to create etalons of microbiologically clean air, water, and a healthy human body. Second is uh, uh, to download that, that existing databases of known pathogens from WHO, research institutes, and uh, other organizations who has this knowledge uh, with corresponding parameters and symptoms. And at the first stage, we will concentrate on the easily measurable parameters and symptoms uh, because uh, technologically we need to develop a lot in order to do more measurements. Then uh, we will build models using machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, and other uh, mathematics, mathematic theories uh, inside this database. Uh, then the next stage will be implementation of this global system in certain territories. Uh, and we are thinking uh, to go first to the country levels, not the international organizations, because uh, only countries, governments, they have now executive power to launch implementation of such project. And here we are talking mainly about the places with massive concentration of people. It could be airports. It could be train railway stations, it could be shopping malls, border crossing points, where there, are, uh, where there is a big number of people simultaneously or where there is a big throughput of people. And uh, then we will start uh, on live online uh, constant measurements of all available parameters. And then we will compare this through machine learning and the artificial intelligence with the database of the existing pathogens. And if we will see something which does not correspond nor to the etalons of the healthy human body or microbiologically clean air or water, or uh, cannot that will not correspond to existing pathogens, this, is the first, this will be the first candidate of unknown pathogen. It means potential disease X. And then, of course, they should be uh, needed further targeted and massive investigation by special organization units. And we discussed about uh, some units from CDC, OEIS, uh, virus detectives, and so on, who can really concentrate on this signal, on this alarm. And the, uh, so the, main, uh, the main idea of the system is to create this alarm. Otherwise, uh, people resources are limited and they cannot go investigate worldwide, worldwide everything. They should in investigate already alarm cases. Now, with regards to the technology, technologically, a lot of things and a lot of devices already exist in certain sense. And here it will be a uh, massive involvement of Internet of Things, sensors, gadgets, and so on. Well, we just will give you several examples. Uh, we just discussed about analyzing wastewater. Technology exists, very easy. Just uh, it, it, the analysis was done practically one year after the, uh, the problem. Uh, then, uh, also in the airports, we can see detectors of explosives. And some, other t uh, and some other similar technologies analyzed already exist. They just need some modification and adjustments and adaptation. Now, uh, when, uh, and here we will need a real coalition because alone we cannot do anything. If we will, even with our friends and business partners, even our friends in some governments of the countries, we cannot do too much. Here, the idea is to create a coalition which later on will be uh, managed 
or coordinated by International Center for Preparedness for Disease X. This could be later on uh, also coordinated with WHO and relevant international organizations. But here it, uh, it will be a real coalition and everybody will bring whatever they have and uh, whatever they're able to do to fight with one enemy. Uh, first is unknown pathogen or pathogens and second to help to fight with uh, already existing enemies, existing pathogens. And uh, here we are just initiating the project. Uh, we are ready to share with uh, all detailed information which we have with the uh, future participants of the coalition, with the experts, professionals from the industry. Uh, and uh, through Horasis, you can contact me anytime. There is a community, uh, some kind of chat. You can do this. We will be ready to cooperate. And welcome for cooperation. And I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, now I will be ready to answer to any questions or any comments, any suggestions, any criti criticism. Welcome. Thank you. Murat, thank you so much for that very clear but overwhelming in scope uh, uh, description of, of what the opportunity is that we have at hand to, to participate in. We need a, a very broad thinking person who is also a deep thinker maybe to provide the first feedback, if the, but whether the criticism or the, uh, the pluses and, and, and how we might be able to get organized. So I'd like to turn to a truly amazing person, I mean, Professor Dr. Ernesto Cajan. Um, he's an epidemiologist, a poet, an activist. Uh, so he, he currently lives in Israel, uh, where he emigrated after the, one, the 1976 coup in Argentina. But before that, he was director general of the Ministry of Health of Argentina. He was a professor of medicine and epidemiology in many universities across Latin America and in the United States. Um, but there's this other side to him. So he's, he's a first vice president of the World Academy of Arts and Culture. <laughs> he uh, is a former president of the Union of Hispano-American Writers. Uh, today, as, as far as I understand, Deputy uh, General, uh, sorry, the Director of the General Ministry, of, uh, I'm sorry, De Deputy Director of the Rabin Medical Center and Head of the Department of Epidemiology uh, at the Institute for Occupational Health. And then personally, <clears throat> I learned that uh, he was the Vice President of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Organization, which won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, in 1985, when he was first vice president, or, and his president at the time actually taught a fantastic seminar I took on preventing accidental nuclear war in college uh, one year after that Nobel Prize. So uh, please, uh, Dr. Kahn, what do you think? What are your initial reactions? I uh, thank you very much for having the opportunity of be in this wonderful workshop with so many important and brilliant people. I am very, very proud to be here. Thank you. Well, I want to ask a question as an epidemiologist. You know that in, a, in, epidemiolo in epidemiology, we define three, three kinds of preventions. Primary prevention, secondary prevention and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is when we when you uh, do uh, early detection of cases during the time the uh, disease is in apparent. So nobody knows about the, this person has the disease, no, no the, the, the patient, neither the doctor. And tertiary prevention is when the person is healed, we prom produce tertiary prevention in order to prevent death or complications. So my question uh, to my friend Murat is uh, if I understood well that this project intend to change the approach 
of the tra traditional epidemiological surveillance, that is, the traditional, huh, is report of disease cases. In this situation, there are already sick people, so we are talking about tertiary prevention. And in the case of epidemics, to prepare for a second wave, a third wave, etc., etc. By the approach of this um, this project, a, a exceptionally very good project, we are uh, approaching the secondary uh, prevention. That is early detection, like a screening in cancer, uh, and a systematic collection of samples in community, in the community, because these people are not sick in order to be hospitalized. So, of course, this kind of type of uh, collection of data from samples in the community must be defined, depends of each one of the agents, and organized. Is, this is, uh, I understand good this, uh, the approach of this project. I will be really happy if you say yes or not. My problem reading this uh, wonderful project is how could we implement it? My question. Thank you, Professor Kahan. Uh, yes, uh, you are perfectly right. Uh, we would like to implement uh, all existing uh, technologies and procedures, including first prevention, primary prevention, or secondary prevention in this case, into the system. And of course, the samples will be collected also in the communities, uh, like uh, even uh, in the, for example, in the hospitals also, when there is a dispensarization is going on, when uh, also uh, in the armies, schools, and so on. But uh, first approach of our project is that uh, we would like to do early detection of the unknown pathogens, and this could be done uh, in, to increase the probability of the successful detection. We need to start collecting samples on, in the places with a massive uh, number of people or there or throughput in through these places. This is a little bit different because uh, I don't think that uh, somebody is now collecting samples on the border crossing points. Absolutely. Uh, uh, some samples are being collected, at least in Barcelona, on the wastewater, but it is not uh, worldwide accepted practice. Uh, from the air, we also don't see that somebody is collecting samples in the airport with the purpose to early detection of the pathogens. I am not talking about explosives and other stuff, which already being done. By the way, the same approach like uh, for the explosives could be used and for the collection samples and uh, checking the air in the airport. That's why technology already exists. It means that the secondary uh, prevention stage in the traditional epidemiology and the healthcare system could be implemented as uh, the collection of data on this stage could be, could be implemented into the database, into the global system project. It will be part of it. It's a little bit wider approach what we are proposing. Not only uh, secondary prevention stage, but also collection of samples everywhere where massively people are existing or going. Thank you. Is, is it possible, before I turn to, to Jose Ramon, is it possible to detect these pathogens or new viruses that are out there in the air or appearing in wastewater, but have not made anyone sick yet? And, and is that the goal? Yes, exactly. Uh, when somebody is sick, and this will not be already unknown pathogen, this be already known pathogen. 
because if a person is sick, then there are symptoms, then uh, uh, doctors are concentrating how to treat that person. And very soon they will understand that this is something new, what has happened uh, in China at the beginning of the pandemic. It's just a matter of days or weeks. If something new, dangerous is really coming. Uh, our system, uh, the, the main goal is to detect the pathogens before person is going to the hospital and reporting, I am sick. But okay. again, if person will come to the hospital and report, I am sick, and proper analysis will be done, this will be again uh, in, in, incorporated into the database. But then we will uh, we will um, name this pathogen as already known. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I see Professor Kahan is contemplating this deeply. Please, the floor is still yours if you want it, or keep contemplating. And I can, I'll move to uh, Professor Jose Calvo. Is that okay? Yeah? All right. So thank you. So uh, Professor Dr. Jose Ramon Calvo is also an epidemiologist and a best-selling writer uh, and an activist. And all those factors, I think, will come together maybe to help us figure out how do you assemble that, that global coalition that Murat was talking about. But he's a retired professor of health education at the University of Las Palmas in the Canary Islands. <laughs> Lovely. He's authored 13 books, including one recent one about the pandemic, uh, The Grand Pause, uh, and that's been the bestseller in several Latin American countries. Uh, and he's, he's the founder of a camp, well, something called the Campus of Excellence Initiative, which brings together a group of young and talented people together to meet with Nobel laureates, heads of state, astronauts, entrepreneurs, people like the ones there on the screen and <laughs> in front of us. Uh, but in addition, in addition, he is also a senior strategic consultant at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center <laughs> and president of the Institute of International Relations uh, at the Royal European Academy of Doctors in Barcelona. So I'm not sure what you haven't done, Jose Ramon, <laughs> sort of like Ernesto, uh, but please, given that rich background, political, activist, supercomputer, uh, computing, epidemiology, please, how can we build that coalition? I think you're, I, you're still muted, Jose Ramon. Okay, now. Uh, thank you, Murat. Thank you, Matthew, for the opportunity to be here with uh, this distinguished group of people. Uh, I think that when I hear the first time about the, this project, I think this is a kind of idea that sh should exist uh, and is not exist that someone should create it because I think it's a very uh, necessary tool and it's very uh, interesting uh, concept. As Ernesto has mentioned before, um, and in the, our previous conversations. I think that uh, the pandemic has shown us uh, several things that we need to, to answer. One is uh, we have a lack of system for detecting the emergency and preventing the spread of new dangerous pathogens on an early stage. Uh, although we have systems created, uh, especially by, uh, by CDC, the Center for Disease Control and the European Center for Disease Control also, uh, has uh, created a long time ago a group of people who was specialized on this um, on the prevention of this kind of and detecting uh, in the early stages this kind of the diseases are called the EIS officers epidemic intelligence service and uh, I think that this could be uh, this uh, uh, tool that Murat is presenting could be a very helpful uh, instrument for the people who really are working on this field. Uh, because they are putting uh, an, a tool on the, their hands that can help them to do their jobs. One of the questions, uh, answering uh, the question that Murat has talking about, uh, to the fact to be able to identify a pathogen before, it's, a, it's an interesting question because uh, there are thousands of uh, um, microbes, uh, viruses, etc., that are not uh, being aggressive with us uh, yet, but will be in the future. For example, coronavirus, we know coronavirus from the uh, middle of the 50s uh, that exists, uh, this, this kind of virus, and, and the, the, the virus, the coronavirus, there are some uh, chains of coronavirus who has created problems uh, on the human uh, from 
I think that from the early uh, 20th century, more, more or less, we know that someone like that has existed. But it uh, happened that when this, the first very well-known coronavirus was the SARS-CoV-1, who started in, in Asia in 2001, uh, and then after that was the MERS, the, uh, the Middle East uh, coronavirus, who was in 2012. And then later arrived this C uh, coronavirus uh, number two. And I think that the question is how we can detect um, the, the, uh, the, the virus or, the, or, or any microorganism who has, uh, didn't appear yet. We can imagine, for example, that the, the bats has a lot of coronaviruses. And some of these uh, coronaviruses that is uh, on the bats probably will uh, be in the future a potential uh, uh, aggressor against the humans. But there are any other kind of, um, of a microorganism or viruses that we, we don't know. Probably if we are able to, to create something that can detect uh, before to start this kind of a, of uh, viruses, it could be possible that we can do something in the future. The things like that probably sounds uh, uh, as science uh, fiction for the people, but uh, some things that was science fiction in the past, we already are using now. And then I think that probably if someone has the idea, I think that the other question is how can we help this person, in this case Murat, that had the idea, to put together, and in, in fact, I think that is absolutely necessary coalition of interest by countries, by organizations, by mm, a group of uh, people that believe that we have uh, we have any any uh, kind of uh, of things to do together to put this idea uh, running on uh, on the future. And I think that definitely this coalition and this create like kind of institute or something like that probably will be a good idea. And uh, for sure, I think that we need to support this kind of initiatives. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Um Before I turn to uh, to our, our final speaker, I just want to let everybody know we've got, we've officially got about 13 minutes left, but we can, we can keep going a little bit afterward. No problem. Uh, maybe for another 10 minutes or so. But I want to encourage folks as well, please submit any comments or questions you might have in the comment section on your screen. And uh, that, that'll keep our discussion even more, even more robust and fruitful. Um, and now I'd like to turn to uh, Matthew Burroughs, uh, my, my colleague at the Atlantic Council, although he's based in Washington and I'm based here in Istanbul, uh, to benefit from his, well, the fact that he's a forward-looking strategic thinker uh, who uh, assesses risks and pulls together the big picture in some really grand writing that I, I really enjoyed, Matt, uh, over the course of the, especially your hundred, the big hundred ideas uh, report. So anyway, so he is director of the Atlantic Council's Foresight Strategy and Risks Initiative, as well as co-director of the uh, New American Engagement Initiative. So that's all about I identifying upcoming uh, mega trends and strategic risks. Uh, he had a 28-year career uh, in the U.S. government at the State Department and at the Central Intelligence Agency. Don't worry. He's a very nice guy. <laughs> um, and his last 10 years he spent at the National Intelligence Council, the NIC, as it's called. And that is the, that is really maybe the most prestigious uh, analytical body in the U.S. Intelligence Committee uh, community. Uh, and, and he actually rose to the third-ranking position in that most uh, prestigious grouping. Uh, and he was the principal drafter of the NIC's publication, uh, Global Trends 2030. So, Matthew, over to you. Uh, how, from Washington's perspective and given your ability to peer into the future, uh, what's your prognosis? Is this possible to achieve? Uh, you're muted. Sorry. You're Thanks, Matthew. And uh, it's very great to be on a panel with, with uh, really such, su such great minds. Um, I, I want to start just by telling a story, uh, and it goes back to the work I was doing at the National Intelligence Agency. Uh, this uh, pandemic. And we talked about basically a scenario in which, uh, Coronavirus would would start in in Central Asia and then 
gradually expand and we had actually some worse predictions on terms of mortality and also on economic uh, damage and so on from from the uh, pandemic. And, you know, in terms of predicting the future, this is about as good as it gets uh, when you can really tell what the what the risk uh, is, where it comes from, what what will happen. The problem is that we could not say what year, you know, exactly when it would would start or or uh, end, and that has been the really the problem with um, thinking about pandemics. Uh, so, as you can imagine, I mean, when I heard about this project, I mean, this is really what is needed. Uh, we need some way of uh, doing early warning. And that that really was lacking with, uh, you know, even though we, we had some, we had a pretty good notion of how it would start, but we didn't know when or we didn't know, you know, didn't have the means actually of, of like this project uh, to, to detecting those early signals. So, you know, this is more than needed. This is actually too, you know, with looking at technology. I mean, it's a sad fact that, as Murat was saying, that we have a lot of these technologies. They may not be organized together exactly. Um, but I think the big missing piece, and this is the part I really worry about, is on the uh, governance side uh, because, you know, unfortunately the, all the other trends are moving in this direction of, of less globalization, more walls being put up, less cooperation. And obviously with, with the U S and China antagonism, a real problem there on, on trying to get cooperation going. That doesn't mean that this is impossible. And what I would say is, you know, we have other examples where civil society has actually been able to put issues on the international agenda and force states to, to pay attention uh, to it. You know, this should be an, we were discussing this yesterday. This should be something that the WHO takes up and really pushes. And unfortunately, from what Murat was saying to us yesterday, I mean, that they haven't really, really looked at something like this. I mean, and that is, that's really appalling. I mean, because uh, again, going back to, uh, to the kind of technologies we have and the ability to, you know, really in other areas to think about early warning. So what we really, I think, need is obviously getting a, some states that will back it, but also we need really civil society and a, uh, and a kind of grassroots movement to push this idea and for states that otherwise are going to be very we're, you know, very, pro it's very problematic putting sensors in and having some international monitoring of it. There are lots of suspicious uh, governments around who, uh, who may want to do that on, <laughs> for other reasons in other, uh, in, um, in their, uh, enemy states, but are, aren't going to want it in, in their own country. So, that I think is the big uh, issue is really how to get it from what has been really proven as a, as a prototype really accepted and put on that international agenda. I don't want to be the Cassandra here because I think this is too important that we should do it, but I do want to be realistic about what the, what the challenges are. No, I think that's uh, those are powerful insights, Matt. And, and 
from the very beginning when Murat and I first discussed this, I mean, I was really worried about about China, and that they, they they've shown no readiness to participate in anything like this or even be anything near transparent. Um, so, uh, what if what if a country's big as China decides not to join, or or Russia, or or India, or whomever? I mean, is something like this still going to be able to gather enough? data and to do enough analysis still to to achieve its objective like what's the critical mass of humanity <laughs> that needs to be part of this well you know you know great ideas don't usually the way they they get to be implemented is you get a few champions and i can see you know a set of countries i can see you know we discussed this yesterday europeans being very interested in it and once you have some backers, then it can get, and hopefully WHO at some point will come along and, and, and back it. Then it can be, you know, put on the agenda of the G20, uh, where basically, you know, China doesn't, in the end, doesn't want to be the uh, only holdout on this. So mm -hmm. the more, you know, and, I actually wrote a scenario basically about this is some months ago last year about, you know, the need for an early warning center and that, you know, I saw both U S and China as having problems because we don't, we don't like, you know, others monitoring us either yeah. that, that much in the U S. So these are both countries that are very, you know, in terms of sovereignty, you're very, very concerned about it. Whereas I think Europe is a would be an easier target since they they have a long tradition now of of regional cooperation, believing in global institutions, regional institutions. So I I think the effort should be to get government backers, get enough of them, then they can push it in, in the international meetings. They can also push it within institutions like the WHO and grad. And so long as we can, you know, the other areas I think I would work on is getting foundation support. So you have, um, so you have some more means to develop the, the project. I mean, there are a number of U S foundations MacArthur has these big ch uh, challenge uh, competitions where they give out quite a bit of money, like $100 million, to develop big ideas. Getting something like that, and then, but getting some, you know, more and more governments to back it over and getting civil society interested in it, that is the way really of, of forcing it on. Uh, to the to the global agenda. Okay, thank you. There's also the, the privacy element as well, right? And uh, Seda Hewitt, who happens to be a friend of mine who lives here in Istanbul, wants to pose a question to us about whether we, you've begun thinking about GDPR related regulations uh, and a strategy for that. So general data protection regulations, which as yeah, mainly apply to the European Union. But any thoughts on that? Maybe I will comment a little bit, although I'm not a big specialist in, the, in that field, uh, uh, data privacy, but uh, what we saw from the coronavirus pandemic uh, lessons, uh, that now you cannot fly to any country, practically to any country, before uh, first we should go and do the PCR test. And this PCR test you should present to the airline on the check-in, they're doing copies and so on. They are just asking you, can you sign here that you are not against that uh, your test will be processed, your, private, uh, your, your data will be processed. And nobody complaining because this is the necessity. And here also we have necessity. If we want to detect uh, the new uh, dangerous pathogen, we need to work and everybody should, uh, should contribute to this. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I agree that uh, relevant mechanisms should be established, re relevant regulations and rules uh, should be formulated. Uh, but uh, before, like two, three years ago, maybe it could be very difficult to do. But now, after coronavirus, uh, people are ready for this. They are ready to give up a little bit uh, their privacy in exchange to the protection uh, or preparedness against the new pandemic, even existing pandemic. 
Uh, this is uh, my comment. And uh, one small comment also about uh, the compu supercomputers and computing power. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, this project technologically was not possible to implement, uh, simply because at that time uh, there was not available uh, necessary computing power and com to process enormous quantity of data, process and analyze. But now maybe it's the right time also from that perspective. But thank you. Thank you. Ernesto wanted to have a follow-up comment. Yes, I, <clears throat> what I want to say is that the, what Jose Calvo said, that the, there are many uh, agents, viruses and many others, that in one, in one step they are not uh, potentially uh, uh, dangerous, but in some way appear. So I don't think that uh, these problems can uh, 